The Boy and the Beast is an interesting film, and I want to spend some time just talking through some of the things I noticed about it. First off, holy heck, it begins with a runaway preteen child. That's a pretty dark premise for a movie to deal with runaway preteens. Uh, and the fact that he's running away um, because of a pretty unhappy home life to an extent. And obviously it's not like there's abuse going on there, but that like there's a reason why he ran away. He's not just petulant, although there's certainly petulance there. Um, and you can tell like this is the wrong choice for him to make. It's interesting because anime especially especially like shonen anime has so many orphan characters so many people who have like run away um in some on some in some capacity and so to use that as the premise but then to immediately invert that by making you feel like oh my gosh he's just made a really bad decision uh, i thought was really interesting for hisoda to make and a, a neat place to start and then like every 30 minutes the movie just jumps and evolves I mean, at first I thought, okay, it's about this runaway kid who finds a father figure. But then, you know, his relationship with that father figure really matures and changes. And then just it seems like there's this constant sense that, okay, we've explored these concepts enough. Now let's go one step further. Let, let's explore another layer of this whole scenario. And sometimes it was psychological and sometimes it was more plot. Sometimes it was simply, okay, we've set up this, you know, duel between these two characters. That's now going to be actually an element. And I thought that was going to be the end of the movie. But, oh, no, that is just the kind of a climactic moment, which just leads in to the climax of the movie. I was really impressed by that. Now, obviously, some folks aren't going to like that. The fact that the movie just evolves in different ways and doesn't have a kind of a straightforward A to B to C you know, clear progression where, you know, in the first two minutes it establishes the, you know, the, um, the what the final scene is going to be. But I really appreciated that. The, the, the movie felt like it had the breadth to expand beyond its initial premise. Now, granted, this is not a complex movie plot-wise, right? Um, it's not like you're sitting there thinking, why are these characters acting the way they are? There's not a lot of intricate character motivation going on here, but that's okay to me because this movie is primarily a character study. It's about these characters and their personality, how those personalities clash, and how those the choices they make because of their personality then impact the story and impact who they are and what they do. Right? It's not about saving the world, although that does kind of come up. But what I really appreciate is that um, we do see how character choice impacts those characters later. Speaking of character choice, I did not expect to see a physical manifestation of despair. That's really interesting. Um, and I love that we see very early in the film that image of like the, the you know the boy's shadow with the little heart spinny thing um and it's never explained or it's not explained there we definitely explain it later or get an explanation of it later and i love that they throw that in there and just let that be a mystery for a good chunk of the film and then it becomes this you know the ultimate um antagonist is fighting off this sort of human despair. Something that is not uncommon as a theme in anime and also in Hisoda's works in general, this idea that um, uh, you know people have to struggle with these internal feelings that can make them feel like they kind of lost hope um, or feel just very frustrated with things. But I really found it interesting that that becomes kind of this shonen villain, just, you know, th this feeling just overwhelms people and then turns them into this, this big problem in the world. Also interesting that the main character basically decides to sacrifice himself, which is a very anime thing to do, a very shonen thing to do, and that it's the girl who says, no, that's not the right solution. Um, that, that, you know, um, all that does is feed into the despair, right? Um, and yes, you've 
prevented the current thing from getting worse, but it doesn't you know, solve long-term problems, and it also um, um, creates, you know, uh, creates more pain, right? Just sacrificing yourself to that would then make her depressed, and then that could definitely continue the cycle, right? Um, also interesting that the you kind know, of that that final solution was to um, fight back with the what he got from his his father figure, um, and I gotta say though, watching it, I was reminded of and this is gonna sound very weird. I was reminded of the ending of Tenchi in Tokyo, one of the Tenchi Moyo TV series, where they actually kind of dealt with this and they had what I thought was a better. Um, answer to this problem uh and it was definitely a shock but also just really was a huge punch to the gut so if you're interested in these kind of storylines i would recommend checking out tension tokyo it has lots of problems um it's not something i recommend you know unreservedly but the ending of that was a really interesting take on how to deal with these sorts of problems so just a thought Speaking of the father figure as kind of the the weapon that he uses as the solution to these problems, it's rather rare, in fact it is rare, to see a movie about fatherhood. Not just about parentage. Usually if, if there's a parental figure, there's also a mother figure. Uh, there's not a lot of single dad stories out there. Um, and even when there is, it's stuff like Finding Nemo, where the two are separated for the entire movie, um, and it's more about his, you know, his journey to get there. It's not really about the, the attempts at bonding between these two, per se. So I found it really affecting to have a story about this guy who um, lost his son and is now trying to get him back, in the case of the human father, um, and is kind of doing his best to do that. And I really loved how... So you, obviously you have these two father figures, and how the, I love how the human father did kind of fail, did actually did just did fail his son, and now is trying to make up for it as best he can, and is genuinely trying to do that. It's not you know it would be so easy to turn that guy into this still shiftless character, into some kind of an antagonist, but no, he's a genuinely nice person who's trying to be there for his son, but is also. Um, aware that if he pushes too hard if he you know tries to be um, in his son's life all the time he can push his son away so it was this wonderfully um um heart-wrenching frankly situation to present for the human father and then to have the beast father um just be an effective father figure by being there you know by always being present for Kuta, um, and that that just meant so much to him, and that Kuta learns really just by mimicking him, which is a very kid thing to do, right? Um, but I just I I found that to be a really effective and affecting uh, element of their relationship. By the way, Kuta, if in case you didn't notice this or didn't know it, um, Q is Japanese for nine, so Kuta I believe is basically nine boy. Um, although Ta isn't necessarily the typical, you know, um, uh, uh, syllable for boy, but I think in, in this case. So basically, um, when when he's asked, you know, what's your name, and he doesn't won't give him his name. And by the way, that's also important because in traditional folklore, if you give someone your name, you're giving them power over you. And so when he doesn't give him his name, that is him saying, I understand this. I get the mythical significance of this world and this scenario and so he just says i'm nine i'm nine and so his name is nine boy right um it kind of uh is similar to the whole thing in Chihiro, in a spirited away where chihiro gets you know, a new name um and her old name is taken away from her um so that is a significant you know thing such that in the big fight when they're doing the countdown one two three four five six seven eight nine and Kuta speaks that's because Kuta is literally nine boy so that's what where all that is coming from FYI finally I want to talk about our ultimate antagonist here and how interesting it was to me that the movie sets up 
the uh, two sons, um, uh, the two sons of the the rival, as the as the potential antagonist, and you see kind of the the more portly kid who's kind of looking down on Kuta, and the more kind of regal kid who doesn't, and then I love how that flips, and I also love not just that, that it flips, but that you see that Kuta and kind of the, the the portly kid get along, like not just not just sort of casually Kuta is used to going to his home and hanging out there like their mother clearly knows him and is used to him coming over so really interesting take on that to make the two of them close right even though their fathers are rivals I really like that and the fact that it's not treated as a big deal it's this casual you know background element of the entire story now I, I do also have to say you know, the movie is not, like I said, it's not particularly subtle. Like, I could tell that the other boy was a human, right? Like, that was a pretty clear thing as the story was going along, and he was, you know, always kept himself all wrapped around and think, oh, obviously he's human. I wonder if the movie was kind of trying to hide that. Um, but I also think this is a movie aimed at adolescent boys. Soda has said that. And so I think he's being coy because he knows some members of the audience won't get it immediately. So why not hold off on that surprise and, you know, maybe some of the younger members of the audience will be shocked when they discover it. Um, and granted, I don't think it was done in a way where when it actually happens, it's a huge, massive shock. Um, I think it plays well to those who didn't figure it out, but isn't annoying to those who did figure it out. I think. So anyway, those are my thoughts on The Boy and the Beast. Again, I think it did some things some very clever things with the shonen formula, with its characters, and um, by combining this kind of shonen formula with a more introspective character study, really. Um, but also, I think that's just um, what Hisoda does, right? He's He does a really good job of blending fantasy with reality uh, and this sort of magical realism uh, in a way that, for, for me, I find just very engaging and interesting. So... Um, so my thoughts, uh, obviously, if you don't like it, that's totally cool. That's different strokes for different folks, but I thought it was definitely an interesting film.